Welcome to the Defense Tech Podcast. I'm Civilian Sydney, your friendly podcast host who knows next to nothing about defense technology. Although I'm not an expert in tech or government, I recently landed in the fascinating world of defense technology on the marketing team here at National Security Technology Accelerator, or NSTXL. NSTXL is a nonprofit that creates and manages contracts, which allows industry to work directly with government on projects. In this podcast, I'll be sitting down with insiders and experts in the defense tech space to explore what's at the forefront of technology and security in the United States. In this series, I'll be interviewing five guests that have valuable insight into this topic, each of them bringing a unique perspective to the problems currently facing our national security. So thank you for joining us in this series. And without further ado, I hope you enjoy this episode with Stephanie Lin, the new director of Microelectronics Commons here at NSTXL. On today's episode, I'll be talking with Stephanie Lin. Stephanie is the new director of Microelectronics Commons, which is an innovative network of regional prototyping hubs. She has 12 years of Department of Defense legislative relations, policy, acquisition, and technical experience. Previous to this role, she served as a Department of Defense contractor who advised and supported various senior leaders within the Office of the Secretary of Defense in anti-tamper, hardware assurance, and microelectronics policy. She holds degrees in electrical and computer engineering. Hi, Stephanie. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Hi, Sydney. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about comments today. Yeah, me too. Much like myself, you're new to NSTXL. Um, but very much unlike myself, you are not new to this industry. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. So prior to coming on board with NSTXL, I worked policy and congressional activities for the Defense Microelectronics Cross-Functional Team for a bit, and I advised on strategy and policy for the Trusted and Assured Microelectronics Program Manager. Uh, prior to that, I also worked in the anti-tamper world on DoD programs and in policy development, drafted a few policies in the years that I spent there, um, and that's where I also uh, started engaging with the microelectronics community. But, you know, over that time, I've watched congressionals on the topic of microelectronics and supply chain security uh, over those years and have gone through the painstaking wills and shalls mm -hmm. of policy development, including, you know, seeing the split of ATNL into RE and ANS and the evolution of microelectronic strategy at DoD. Nice. Very cool. Um, this is just my inexperienced question, but what is what is ATNL? What What's the split of that mean? Acquisition technology and logistics, that's what ANS and RE &E used to be uh, prior. They used to be consolidated into one uh, oh. organization. Okay, so it's probably a little messy when that all split up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's certainly a lot of work, uh, you know, that had to be done into reorganizing a lot of leadership uh, reestablishment and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. I, I know recently they just reestablished the DASDs and the ASDs. Uh, at the leadership levels. Um, prior to that, they were called uh, deputy directors and things like that mm -hmm. uh, because statute at the time limited them to the number of those positions they could have. So they had to mm -hmm. establish those temporary positions in the meantime. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. On the other end of that, you've worked on the government side also. Um, previous to this role, you served as a Department of Defense contractor within the Office of the Secretary of Defense. I'm curious to know like what you learned from that role. So there are a heck of a lot of passionate people in the government. Uh, and at the <laughs> end of the day, there ultimately are some universal truths. There's a certain economy to the ecosystem that you have to learn to work with. Uh, there's a constant push and pull between government and industry, government not yeah. having sufficient demand to influence industry outcomes, and then industry wanting that top-down requirement. Uh, there's balancing between being too uh, being descriptive enough and to develop meaningful policy, but also not being too prescriptive to stifle mm -hmm. that innovation and flexibility everybody wants, right? So on top of that, you know, the little guys are incentivized differently than the big guys. There's also, mm -hmm. you know, there also needs to be a balance between the technical and the strategic mindsets. I think both should be able to provide input. input uh, Bridging the gap between the two of any of these is a careful game of defining objectives and understanding what motivates the two bodies to collaborate together, while, of course, being mindful of the political mm -hmm. changes that occur every four years. Um, mm -hmm. you know, success is truly defined by the navigation of the art of people and processes when it comes to the Pentagon. 
Wow. Sounds like you learned a lot. <laughs> um, with all that experience, it, it really does sound like you'd be a really great fit to to manage the new program, the Microelectronics Commons program, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. But what made you decide to take this role? So having spent so much time at the right hand side of the government and in its acquisitions, I wanted to immerse myself more on the private sector side to understand better mm -hmm. the challenges from that perspective. Uh, I know there are a lot of barriers to overcome and conversations to be had, and I truly seek out this challenge because I know that's where the growth happens and the best lessons learned are obtained. Uh, the engineer in me appreciates overcoming adversity as well as the benefits from doing so. So I'd like to think that I have an opportunity to make an impact by bridging some of that dichotomy. Mm -hmm. And you think microelectronics commons can achieve that? I think there's a lot of opportunity to see what we can do when we bring <laughs> the nation together to establish this technology pipeline and uh, workforce initiatives. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, as the director of Microelectronics Commons, can you just walk us through what it is, what Microelectronics Commons is, how it functions and what it hopes to achieve? Sure. So, you know, I've described it to some people as kind of being like, a, you know, a superintendent trying to establish uh, a network of schools, right? You mm -hmm. need to figure out where the locations are going to be. You're going to need to understand the resources, what technologies they're going to need, the textbooks they're going to need. Maybe some textbooks will share cross department, maybe mm -hmm. cross schools. You know, so understanding um, some of what are those common needs are. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the other really interesting parts of that analogy is the fact that, right, the, the intent of a school is to move students through and graduate them. Yeah. I think that same analogy can be used for technologies as we, you know, prototype. Uh, you know, it's intended to be a pipeline. So move these technologies, yeah. mature them through to the next stage and ultimately overcoming that valley of death, right? Continuing to talk about that tech transition piece. So you know, I, I think that school analogy really helps, uh, I guess, bring some real world relatability to all of that. But, um, you yeah. know, using that analogy, the commons <laughs> is structured to be comprised of hubs, cores and a consortium manager, which is NSTXL. Yeah. Right. We had the eight uh, hubs that were announced and the cores would be working as an integral part of those hubs as well. And DoD would providing would be providing that oversight uh, over a five year <laughs> period through the CHIPS Act. So the hubs are the primary interface for the government and NSTXL to the community. So keeping in mind that I can't speak on behalf of the government and a lot of what they've messaged has been through the RFS and community engagement so far, including the annual meeting uh, that was a couple of weeks ago. I can speak to how I'm planning to engage the hubs to provide that those meaningful and productive outcomes. So. You know, once again, there are eight hubs, and this is intended to be a national effort with NSTXL mm -hmm. as a consortium manager, right? I see my role as facilitating that cross hub collective in alignment with national and duty strategic objectives to ensure that we can all leverage the benefits of aggregated effort while enjoying the agility of independent operations, right? The best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, competitive collaboration. So the infrastructure is just as important as the technology, or even more important, I, I could argue, as the technology is the short game, uh, but the infrastructure itself really provides that long haul lab to fab prototyping pipeline that should sustain beyond the selected technologies for the next five years. So I intend to leverage the Commons Hub Board that I spoke about during the annual mm -hmm. meeting uh, mm -hmm. for much of these cross hub infrastructure, as well as technology discussions. Wow. Yeah, I, I know that was a mouthful, but I appreciate you explaining all that. That sounds um, like a big undertaking, but very exciting. Um, so I am on the marketing te team here at NSTXL. I, I run our, our press relations and content. So I know from my experience, there's like a lot of buzz around this project um, since the hub awardees were announced, as you said, at the Pentagon by the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kathleen Hicks. Um, so I've, I've seen that firsthand. How do you think that the interest in nationwide, even global support that this program has received will impact its success? So I think the most obvious first answer is that it's going to result in a large influx of submissions and inqu inquiries, which, mm -hmm. you know, means we'll ideally be receiving some of the highest quality ideas out there from folks who want their voices to be heard. 
So given the fantastic speaker lineup at the annual meeting and the incredible turnout, mm -hmm. it shows that the Commons received significant report, support at all levels. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, this also means a lot of incentivized collaboration and synergy at the regional level to further establish those relationships and economies for the long haul. Nice. So I know you previously mentioned the the valley of death and the goal of bridging that gap. Can you explain to us what the valley of death is and how this project will attempt to bridge that gap? Yeah, sure. So the valley of death is that proverbial purgatory where technology <laughs> projects struggle to transition to end use applications. So this is caused by uh, what I mentioned before, which is the dichotomy of two entities that are not in alignment. Uh, in this particular case, on the one hand is the push development approach of technologies kind of in a bottoms up fashion in anticipation that as the technology development matures, the operational end use of these capabilities will become more apparent uh, and those connections for transition can then be made. However, on the flip side, the system and the program side relies upon requirements driven design and processes, which are defined by both top down technology and programmatic requirements. <clears throat> Therefore, that misalignment between these in which technologies aren't successfully transitioned or integrated into systems or end applications is called the valley of death. Yeah. So Commons provides that linkage to an end application for project submission so the two ob objectives can be aligned from the start. I think it's funny that they picked so kind of intense of a term to <laughs> define that valley of, um, death. valley of death. Yeah, I think it really emphasizes the um, the importance and the impact mm. of uh, what goes on between those two sides. Though. Yeah, the pressure of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so in, in order for this program to be successful, I've gathered that like collaboration obviously is a very important piece, has to be at the forefront. Um, so the Microelectronics Commons is going to have a lot of collaboration opportunities. Can you tell us more about the collaboration element of Commons and, and how people can get involved in that? Sure. So firstly, I'll mention since it was briefed at the annual meeting, no, you don't have to be a hub member to get involved. So then, you know, the next question I get asked is what motivates an organization to want to become a member, if that's the mm -hmm. case? To that, I answer the government has selected eight hubs for a reason, right? They are the primary interface points of the community, and they will each establish their own hub model for engagement. Ideally, the members would receive the most intimate level of comms with the hubs. And additionally, those hubs will be the ones that can access the NSTXL call for projects. So further, based on the briefings at the annual meeting, many hubs were offering very minimal entry criteria to becoming a member. And in addition to that, that Commons Hub Board I mentioned earlier will be leveraged for cross hub discussions and a representative from each hub will need to speak on behalf of their hub. Therefore, establishing that relationship with the hubs, whether it's contractual, it's member based or something else, it'll certainly help support uh, for organizations at the CHB level, the Commons Hub Board level. So I know that many organizations have already come up to me and mentioned that they have been communicating across hubs, which is fantastic and highly encouraged. Yeah, very cool. Um, so again, Microelectronics is more than just a project, as you explained earlier with your superintendent analogy, which I love. Um, it's also the establishment of a longstanding technology pipeline and ecosystem that the goal is to enable long-term global U.S. semiconductor leadership and innovation. So other than these prototyping project and manufacturing hubs, can you tell us like what's next for the program as a whole? Yeah, sure. So I keep talking about infrastructure. So one of the priorities besides the call for projects, of course, uh, you know, by the end of the calendar year or first quarter mm -hmm. FY24, or is to establish the Commons Hub Board and to begin identifying priority discussion topics, such as the establishment of an EDA IP approach as the project's near. Uh, I know these conversations have already been happening, but we need to solidify these relationships as we approach go time. So we also want to be able to set the precedent and maybe even the status quo on similar hub structures moving forward. Awesome. Well, great. I think that's all I'm going to um, drill you on today. I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to me. It was super insightful. I feel like I'm going to watch this video and take notes and, and study this conversation. It was so helpful. But um, anyways, congratulations on the launch of Microelectronics Commons. 
And I know I'm looking forward to seeing what happens in the next months and years. Thanks, Sydney. Uh, thanks for having me.